It is a genuine pleasure to be here. And, and I hope from the very beginning to dismiss any formalities. The whole Dr. Kane thing really makes me nervous. Um, I'm always afraid somebody's not going to realize and ask me to uh, deliver a baby or do an appendectomy or some such thing. So uh, Kelly is, is just fine. Uh, quite honestly, I see this as, well, it's an honor to be asked, first of all, and I see it as a, a true sign of the number of communities that I, that I work with on this very discussion. And in terms of how they frame it in the context of their own communities, because every community is different. We can, we can talk about sustainability from now until in the morning. But it is, it is truly at the community level where the rubber meets the road, as we'll, as we'll talk more about. And so as, as Dave uh, chatted about, talking about sustainability, it's kind of uh, the presentation now is broken up basically into, th into thirds. Uh, uh, what sustainability is, and there's all kinds of ways to define it, and I'll certainly talk about it in terms of how I think it needs to be defined from a comprehensive planning standpoint. We'll talk about why sustainability has become the, the topic that it has, uh, controver very controversial in, in some contexts. Uh, and then what to do with it. How do, you, how do you actually integrate it into a plan and actually implement it in such a way that you notice a difference in your community that you would not maybe have known otherwise. So as we go through this, um, uh, we could obviously spend hours uh, and so if you have questions or something that is just that you really want to hit on at the time that we're going through it, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And if I know that we're going to get to that, I'll kind of hold you off. Otherwise, I'll do my best to, you know, we can have that conversation as we go through. Because I don't, I, I want you at the end of the time that we have tonight, when you leave and you ask yourself the question of whether or not you wasted an evening, uh, I certainly, obviously, don't want that answer to be no. Uh, and so it's, it's important that, that I'm here to respond to in the best way I can to whatever questions that, that you might have that I, can, that I can help you with. So as Dave said, I'm, I'm director at the St. Croix Institute for Sustainable Community Development. It's a mouthful. Uh, but we're really focused on the community context of sustainability. Uh, as we'll talk about in, in a little bit, uh, but there is, there is no doubt that there is a sense of anticipation, a sense of anxiety, a sense of overwhelming challenge, of overwhelming opportunity, and it wouldn't matter whether this was John McCain or Barack Obama or whoever else might get, uh, uh, have gotten elected into president, it's kind of like, holy buckets. Um, the expectations are, are pretty high. A very quick sort of perspective. Uh, we're the third rock from the sun. We are a rock about 8,000 miles in diameter that it takes 365 days to make one trip around our sun. In order to make that trip, we're doing roughly 66,600 miles per hour. So imagine a rock, a professional baseball player, if they can throw a 100-mile fastball, that's really, really fast. Imagine a rock 8,000 miles in diameter doing over 66,000 miles per hour, and we now have how many passengers on that rock? We're somewhere in the neighborhood of 6.6 .6 billion. Okay? There are roughly, uh, and you'll see varying accounts as we talk about the science tonight, there's roughly 340 to 360,000 people born per day, roughly 120,000 people die per day. We're adding about a net of about 200 and, and you'll find a range, but roughly around 220 to 225,000 people to the daily planet population. Most of those in less developed countries. Uh, and so when we think about this in terms of energy, food, water, shelter, clothing, all the things that we think are necessary for a reasonable standard of living, um, it's getting a little crowded in some ways. This is maybe somewhat of an overused uh, slide in the sense of depicting where we are, but it is, it is the test tube. As far as we know, unless you know, Captain Kirk and Dr. Spock show up, this is home. Uh, and so there are clearly some challenges ahead of us that we really need to be giving some thought to 
And those elephants in the room are not necessarily fun to talk about. They're not easy to talk about, especially when you try to talk about all of them at once. But sustainability is inherently a concept that tries to look at not only the issues, but the solutions in a very holistic, integrated sort of way. It is uncomfortable to think about uh, state, personal, and national debt, socioeconomic disparity and stress, political or religious polarity, water quality, quantity, food shortages, climate change, peak oil, other, other sorts of threats. It's uncomfortable, but it is also, uh, if, if you don't go out of here with anything else tonight, to see this as an opportunity. Uh, because I can assure you that there are other organizations that are out there who are trying to make sure that this is not what happens. We need to look around the corner and make sure that these two people see each other coming. And there are some circumstances around which, and you can imagine what I punched into Google in order to find that particular cartoon. <laughs> um, and I paid to use it. It's from a cartoonist in Great Britain uh, that I pay about 20 bucks a year in order to keep that cartoon, but it's, it's pretty important. In thinking about sustainability, invariably the shortest definition that I know of and the one that I use is that it's simply the attempt to avoid unsustainability. Think about the use of that word. It would not probably have even come into our vocabulary and be used in the ways that it's being used if we weren't either consciously or unconsciously aware of circumstances that challenge the status quo, that challenge our comfort, that challenge our optimism about the future, that we're leaving the world a better place than we found it. And there's a lot of data out there that tends to indicate that. But it is, I think, an important element to this to think about it in, and especially from a, from a local standpoint, that it means the leadership in the attempt to avoid unsustainability. On the other hand, I think that there is a phenomenal amount of urgency that kind of needs to be put to this. And so oftentimes you will find folks who will talk about sustainability, well, it's just another scaremongering conspiracy of the bleeding heart liberal left. Uh, and you will find counter arguments of the liberal left against the right and that sort of thing. But I can, I can assure you that the slides that you're getting ready to see in a few minutes see this in a very positive sort of way. That it's opportunity riding on uh, a dangerous wind. And there are lots, I mean, if you go out to Google, there are tens of millions of hits about sustainability. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to, um, to try and get our heads around. The most common definition is the one that's been uh, published by the UN, the Brundtland Commission in 87, which is uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's a great definition in terms of defining the ethics. You know, it defines the value system. It simply says we have a responsibility to our current generation and those around us, and we have responsibility to those who will follow. It doesn't say anything about how to go about doing that. It doesn't say anything about principles or practices. And that's oftentimes the, the jumping off point for a lot of people is, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, you know, we get to the point, we know what the ethics are and what the sense of responsibility is, but getting it down to the nuts and bolts is, is where we're going to go tonight. There are those who, uh, who carry this to the extreme. Uh, and obviously I would take issue with this particular one, but this is from Tom DeWeese, uh, who writes for News of Views. I will tell you now, if you want to keep your guns, your property, your children, and your God, if you love liberty, then sustainable development is your enemy. Okay? That's, those are folks who take this conversation to mean that this is nothing more than a conspiracy to one world government. Well, you know, if that's, if that's where they want to take the conversation. But... Um, I tend to lean on Mark Twain in this particular regard. What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And, and that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight in terms of the science. This is not something that is um, not being highly calculated. So for instance, this is a set of threats that was developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. If you go out to their website, they are one of the premier business websites in the world. They represent 200 of the largest multinationals in the world who have adopted sustainable development as their primary business model. 
And like any organization or business, we can greenwash the daylights out of this in terms of using this as uh, smoke and mirrors in terms of saying we are something that we're not. But these are, I was on sabbatical at, at one of the major multinationals here in the region in 2000 when this came out. And this was the list of truths that they assumed to be the reality of the 21st century that their business models would have to adapt to if they intended to remain profitable, much less remain in business. So this is what they assume to be the reality of the future, that they know that their business models have to integrate or they won't be in business. Okay? So this is, this is uh, very strongly in the business community and so there's about a half a dozen slides here to give you a sense that while some of the science that we talk about in terms of climate and peak oil and food shortages, that sort of thing, is, is paralysis for many people. It's like, ooh, buckets. I don't even want to think about that. To companies like I'm getting ready to show you, that's strategic information. That's information that they walk into their boardrooms and conduct strategic planning, comprehensive planning, just like you're doing at the county level. They do it at the business level. And they basically say, where does our products and services need to be in the future at the point that we know that these things will come to the surface in the marketplace? Okay. How do we take advantage of that information? So the Dow Jones, for instance, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, uh, very prestigious index to be on, and, and companies very much desire to be on that uh, Dow Jones Index. 3M. Walmart, and we can have all kinds of discussions about the corporate image of, of these, but Walmart recognizes. I mean, we can badmouth Walmart all we want for in some context in terms of what they do to small business competitiveness in, in communities. At the same time, they, are, they have leverage in the marketplace to bring green technologies uh, into the marketplace at economies of scale that are very, very difficult to match. Uh, despite the fact that they are still a major importer of many of those goods when they started out by being, Sam Walton I suspect is rolling in his coffin because uh, they started out as buy in America. Uh, I mean that was one of their premier principles and they have very much migrated uh, away from that. And hopefully, and they're showing signs of moving, moving back. But greenhouse gas emissions they know is worth billions of dollars to them which we'll talk more about. Uh, General Electric. General Electric cannot even keep up with the amount of demand for wind turbines. They're now one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers in the world. They bought, when you, if you remember when Enron melted down, their wind turbine manufacturing for Enron was one of the only profitable arms of Enron. General Electric bought it for $1 billion and has reaped uh, multiple benefits out of that. Uh, their revenues are way beyond projections, so whether it's in renewable energy or reverse osmosis water, healthcare, whatever it happens to be. Uh, T. Boone Pickens, who obviously has some horses in this race, wants to see uh, the transportation fleet, especially trucks, move to natural gas. That is all domestic as well as major uh, wind in the, in the Texas panhandle, recognizing that we are highly dependent. So when we think about this, not only in terms of, of addressing these issues, but how do we make money at addressing these issues? How does your county make money at addressing these issues? And, and uh, put itself in a position that it will be very proud of in the future. So out of the 70 plus definitions that are published, this is the one that I use at the Institute. It's not necessarily anybody, any better than anybody else's, but this is where We've distilled all this down uh, to what we think is, is a viable way to go at this. A community is sustainable only to the degree that it is locally self-sufficient in energy, food, water, shelter, clothing, transportation, employment, and commerce, scaled to the equitable, equitable needs of all of its citizens and within the carrying capacity of native ecosystems over multiple generations. Okay, a mouthful. But sustainability is not a soundbite. It again is a very holistic, integrated way of looking at the issues and the solutions. And we put it in the context of, uh, Dave was just telling me that Richard Longsworth was here just a couple of months ago, who wrote Caught in the Middle, which is an expose of what has happened to the upper Midwest over the last 40 or 50 years. There's nothing new about sustainability other than the word. Sustainability is nothing more than reclaiming the culture that we were 40 or 50 years ago. We have basically uh, outsourced ourselves 
into a really nasty corner, uh, especially economically, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. 40 or 50 years ago, we were, all, for all practical purposes, self-sufficient in terms of energy. We were self-sufficient in terms of food. We had vertically integrated food systems throughout rural and urban Wisconsin, but throughout rural Wisconsin. Um, uh, the same thing in terms of, of water, clothing, we can have a long discussion about, but transportation, employment, local employment and commerce, and we'll get into more of the details about those. So this is not necessarily anything that's dramatically new. There are lots of communities across Wisconsin who are passing sustainable community resolutions in a very formal sort of way, and we'll talk more about that. Those resolutions are not worth the paper they're printed on, quite frankly, unless they're acted upon. Uh, and we'll, we'll spend more time talking about that. But this is, this is also one of the, really one of the best websites I really encourage you to go out to and spend some time with. Uh, that was put up by UW Extension, uh, and, and uh, of Jenny's representation, and by the UW Extension sustainability team, which I'm also an external member on. And it's a Sustainable Community Capacity Center. So if you, if you don't get the email off of there, just go to Google, punch in UW Extension Sustainable Community Capacity Center. Just a wealth of information and growing all the time. Very, very worth it. Uh, and you'll find out there the, the verbatim resolutions that have been passed by uh, over 24 uh, communities now. And that's at the municipal level, uh, village, town, and, and county level. Uh, but as, and, and I, at the risk of, of insulting any sensitivities, although I did see the, the beer barrel fire competition back there in one of the pictures, so I'm, um, this is a community when it was thinking about its priorities for comprehensive planning, make sure that they got a microbrewery first. Um, this is Dave's Brew Farm, which is in Wilson, Wisconsin. Uh, he's put up a 20 kW wind turbine. He's growing all of his own hops. He is moving toward a totally self-sufficient microbrewery. Uh, which has not only phenomenal economic benefit to him because of the least cost of his inputs, but the marketing side of this is just huge. Plus, we brew good beer. That's kind of the what is sustainability. Questions, comments, reactions? At a, at a base, it's all about self-sufficiency. So be thinking, as, as you're thinking about your comprehensive plan, and I know some of the discussion tonight was about visioning, how far out on the limb are you willing to climb? Uh, that's, that's where the conversation usually goes. And I really encourage you to think about it from a self-sufficiency standpoint, and we'll talk about it from an energy and food in, in a few minutes. Dave? I just wanted to clarify that you used the word local in terms of self-sufficiency, and local meaning the community that you're in. Yep, and it, and it very commonly does. Uh, you will find communities... For, for example, I mean, we're almost at the 45th parallel. You know, we're halfway between the equator and the pole. It's very difficult to be self-sufficient here. You've got to be pretty hardy to do that. Uh, if we were living at the equator in a tropical region, local will become really local because you don't have the geographic sorts of stresses in order of energy, food, water, typically. But at the 45th parallel, that's very difficult. And so the sense of local does expand out as broadly as you need to make that. So for instance, when we're talking about a local food system at the university, and we're trying to buy, we're trying to move toward buying as much local food as we possibly can for the university, we know that we're going to run up against a limit, first and foremost, probably when we talk about coffee. <laughs> uh, or students who want mangoes in the middle of January. Um, you know, it would be a lot of energy in a greenhouse to get there. So it does, it, it varies depending on the context to which it's applied, but uh, our notion is, and, and we're, we'll talk about some projects where we're sure that we're proving it, uh, it's local, is much more local than we oftentimes think about. Other questions, comments? Okay, this next section is kind of why is this occurring? And this is, this is oftentimes people will say the scary part. Uh, I find no pleasure in some of this, but we need to really think about the science and the reality behind some of these issues. Uh, because again, the companies that I showed you a few minutes ago, they see this as strategic opportunity while everybody else is paralyzed with fear. 
they are, I can guarantee you, uh, just because of some of the relationships that I have with some of those companies, um, they're going down the road in a very strategic sort of way. They know how they're going to make money at this. We've run out of, we've run out of, uh, of space on the, um, uh, the national debt clock in New York. The one is now in with a dollar sign. And this was taken back in January, so we now know that we're at least 11 and a half trillion and rising pretty quickly. Um, but we also know that we have a ethical relationship. And, and this is one that Thomas Jefferson wrote very early in our history. Then I say that the earth belongs to each generation during its course, fully and in its own right. No generation can contract debts greater than may be paid during the course of its own existence. We're going to have a tough time with that one. <laughs> we also know that China is now the largest purchaser of U.S. Treasury bonds, although they have been backing off. There are about a, th about a trillion U.S. dollars in Chinese Central Reserve banks. Uh, we are paying them interest, uh, plus uh, a very healthy share of our monthly uh, trade deficit. And they have been making a lot of noise recently that they are very worried about the value of the dollar. Because every time the dollar goes down in value, when you have a trillion dollars and you start talking about the percentage of decline in value of the dollar, that is a lot of money being lost very quickly. And so they, are, they have quadrupled the amount of gold in their reserves. Uh, over the last couple of years, and they are buying other utility commodity values as quickly as they can with, quote unquote, our money, uh, because they're, they're a little concerned about where the dollar is going. The other side of this, or another side of this, and one that we recognize has been a major influence, is the adjustable rate mortgage reset. This is in January of 07. We are now in uh, month, let's see, that now put us in month. Um, January 09 and 6 uh, would put us right about here, about month 30. You can see what we've just come through that pretty much, very much contributed to the unhinging of the banks. And then we've been in kind of the eye of the hurricane for the past four or five months, trying to catch up. We are now hitting a new high in some adjustable rates. We will level back off again, and then we go into a whole lot more of adjustable rate mortgage reset. Whether or not we are going to be able to get ahead of that is yet to be seen in terms of what kinds of, of uh, incentives that are brought about at the federal level in order to get those folks refinanced or whatever it happens to be. But these are, uh, many of these are option arms which are, are even not as good as uh, subprimes. Please. So those are predictions and on what are the predictions based? Those are based on the actual schedule of mortgages that were taken out historically that have actual legal time limits by which those mortgages will reset. So as people who bought like uh, interest only uh, mortgage loans that a, have a time period attached to them at which uh, they have to start paying in on principal and they automatically see a rise in their interest rates. So it was an incentive to get people to buy houses to get in very cheaply with the idea that property values would continue to rise they would sell out, they would refinance, and so now many of those people find themselves upside down in their mortgages with their houses worth less than the mortgage itself that they originally bought, and they can't get out of them. So that's what the federal government's now trying to do in terms of incentives to get people refinanced into uh, 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 set interest rate loans or refinanced in whatever ways that they can because it's, uh, there's, there's still a lot of liability to go. And this doesn't even talk about commercial real estate, which is showing some, some really tough signs, uh, as well as credit card debt and consumer debt. Honestly, I don't know off the top of my head what the dollar value, and, and because one, one end would be what they actually purchased them in at the, at the versus where the market is now, and, and it's worth far less than it was when they bought them. Does this have any correlation to what interest rates would do on the rest of the borrowing market? Probably not, uh, because there is so much attempt to try, and the federal government knows that if, if they allow interest rates to rise uh, in ways that they're in a free market sort of way, that uh, as opposed to trying to get some ceiling on that, so predictability in the system, uh, 
so yeah, it could run either way, but the, the government is doing its best to try and make sure that, that, that the horses don't get turned loose on that. Um, on the other hand, interest rates could very well begin to rise, especially in terms of treasury bonds, because the, as the dollar, as the value of the dollar goes down, people and and there's more risk to that to that dollar. People want a higher interest rate in order to take that risk, uh, in order to offset that potential decline in the value. And so there are all kinds of variables at at play here. We are, this is a comparison of the drops that we've seen historically. This is the tech crash uh, in, in the uh, 80s and, and 90s. The oil uh, crisis uh, in the mid 70s, the stock market crash of 29. And so this was a comparison of, of those four drops and where we are currently and uh, the attempt is to make sure that we don't have that second lag. I won't spend a lot of time with this one, but you've heard a lot about derivatives. And this is of great concern in terms of federal policy, but there are a number of estimates now of derivatives that are estimated at roughly $1,600 trillion. That's basically $1.6 quadrillion. And, and there is a tremendous amount of concern about uh, the true legitimate value of those when you have seen leverage after re-leverage after re-leverage of mortgages as well as other securities that have been grouped and sold and resold on a worldwide basis. And so we look at the value of those derivatives versus all other assets in terms of, of uh, real estate, in terms of securitized debt and stocks. Uh, currencies, and then down to gold and silver, which we went off uh, the gold and, and silver during uh, the gold standard during the Nixon era. There's only about 150,000 tons of gold and silver in the world, and gold is worth about two trillion dollars at current estimates, and silver about four trillion. So you look at all those uh, values and liability. The value of gold would be thousands of percent greater if it were allowed to rise to the value of. Of those, of those currency values. That's the quick trip through the financing side. This is uh, fun with climate change. And I keep trying to find out who these two guys are, so if anybody, anybody recognizes these guys, I haven't gotten their permission yet to keep using their, their picture. Climate change, as I'm sure you are, uh, we could spend the entire evening just talking about the, the science on this one. The IPCC, the International Panel, International, Internet, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, over 30,000 peer-reviewed scientific reports and consensus now that has been narrowing and narrowing in terms of because of the number of repeated studies and scientists uh, always checking each other in terms of methodology and results and conclusions and, and recognizing that there's a very strong consensus that uh, human-generated greenhouse gases are contributing a significant amount to what we now recognize to be uh, warming of the planet. This is uh, just before President Bush left office. Uh, all of the climate science uh, program reports were finally released uh, just before he left. And I have not read all those reports, but the, the reviews that I have read, you find almost the identical language that came out of the White House's own climate science program that was identical to the IPCC. So this is not, uh, again, this is, this is science that is on both sides of the political ticket, uh, although we've, we've certainly debated whether that was reality. The concern is that based upon ice records that we have of glaciers uh, that you just like you can cut down a tree and you can count the number of rings and actually do a chemical analysis of the growth rings to determine what the growing conditions were at the time that tree grew, you can do the same thing with glaciers. So you can drill, we have glaciers that are two miles deep in uh, Antarctica and Greenland, and so you can literally take a core sample and take them into a lab and identify the uh, gas concentrations that were in the atmosphere that each year that that snow was laid down that was converted to ice. We now know that we're at roughly 390 parts per million, which is over that 450,000 years, there are a number of studies that go back 600,000 and one now back to 800,000, that we are off the charts. Uh, and it is, again, it doesn't 
by itself doesn't prove anything, but it clearly is associated with trends that we know in the past have very strongly uh, high and highly correlated. This is methane, which uh, is about 20 to 21 times more powerful than CO2 on a molecule by molecule basis. Uh, and so it is also a gas that has a tremendous amount of power here. We've gone up about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit in a little over 100 years. About half of that rise has occurred in the last 30 years. Uh, there's clear indications that it is speeding up. And you've probably heard a number of discussions about climate change in regards to, well, sunspots. And, and we've had a couple of cool years and there's no sunspots. Well, that's absolutely correct. But if you look at the rest of the data, this is the cycle that we typically go through with sunspots and with what's known as southern oscillation. Southern oscillation, more commonly you hear it as El Nino. El Nino is the, uh, the warming and cooling of the Pacific Ocean and then how that affects weather patterns. And we have been in this decline since about 1998. Uh, and we're at the bottom of that trough. And assuming that this pattern holds true, we will start to go back up the other side. There is just recent uh, science coming out of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and there are a number of scientists who are now predicting what they think could be a very strong El Nino uh, push between now and August. Uh, and, and that simply kind of exasperates the, the situation. This is the overall trend in global temperature. And 1998 was clearly uh, an anomaly sort of year, and clearly it has, it, we've seen this plateau, although we're still kind of rising right, right in here. And the concern is, it's, it's not that the weather on any particular day or any particular season proves anything. It's the overall trend that we need to be paying attention to. And it's, and it's again, highly correlated to what we have seen historically. So scientists can only look at the historical record and observe what's going on now and based upon a sense of confidence about how they're repeating each other and, and studying each other's uh, gaps and faults that uh, the prediction is we will only continue to see more warming uh, based upon the amount of carbon and methane and other gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. The thing that many people are watching is this one. It's the rate of the, the melting of the Arctic. Um, right now, Russia, the United States, Denmark, Norway, Canada, I'm missing somebody, are racing to identify what part of the Arctic Ocean that, they are, that we are all claiming uh, for our continental shelves. Nobody cared for thousands of years, but Russia just a little over a year ago, almost 15 months ago, took a submarine and planted a titanium flag at the North Pole at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean only because they know that the ice is going to be gone and it's probably going to be gone much sooner than we thought that it is. So in terms of oil and gas exploration, commercial fisheries, commercial shipping lanes, military advantage, everybody's laying claim to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the models are now, uh, five years ago we were saying, oh, it'll be 2,100 before the Arctic will be ice free. Three years ago as well, the models are now indicating 2050. A couple of years ago, well, it was 2035. The most recent models are indicating we could see an ice-free Arctic uh, as early as 2013 to 2015 uh, at the rate at which the melting is occurring. That has major implications commercially, but it also has major implications ecologically because it means that the Arctic Ocean all of a sudden becomes an absorber of solar energy rather than a reflector of solar energy. And that has some major sorts of positive feedback mechanisms that we, we would probably just as soon live without. Again, companies are counting on climate change, not only in terms of helping to solve the problem, but here's PepsiCo, who I don't know how much money they spent, but they were the first US company to literally put a carbon footprint uh, on one of their commercial products that is a third party certified audited product. That's a half a gallon of Tropicana orange juice that has a carbon footprint of 3.75 pounds. They didn't do that for fun because companies never invest money for fun. They did that because they know it is going to be worth a lot of money in the carbon market that we are almost invariably going to see in the not too distant future uh, because of the consensus that we are now arriving in. General Electric is doing the same thing. 
And these are just two examples. You can go out and find all kinds of examples. Quick trip through climate change. Peak oil. How many of you are familiar with peak oil? Somewhat. Okay, at least you've heard the, heard the term. Tremendous amount of study that's going on, a tremendous amount of literature that's out on this, this particular issue. It is, uh, if you, again, if it's the, the popular media, the mass media doesn't cover it for a wide variety of reasons that we could talk about, but to give you a sense that of who else is thinking about this, this is Johns Hopkins University and Hospital who just sponsored a major uh, conference on peak oil and, and healthcare, the implications of peak oil on healthcare. So it is something that major institutions are taking very seriously. We are, we're currently, we were at about 21 million barrels per day consumption uh, on a daily basis in this country. We're now at about 19 million barrels because of the decline in demand with the recession. We're still burning about 25% of the world's uh, daily supply, and that's about an 80 million barrel per day, or I'm sorry, yeah, 80 million barrel per day market uh, across the world. Uh, it was up close to around 85. Uh, but we're burning somewhere around 32 billion barrels per year. That's an important number to kind of remember because when you hear in the news that Brazil found a oil field off of their east coast that was 8 billion barrels and the general public goes, see, we told you, there's tons of oil that's out there. Well, 8 billion barrels in a 32 billion barrel per year market, that's a three-month supply. That's assuming that you could even get it out of the ground in that length of time. Uh, soon after that, they found another field that's estimated at roughly 33 uh, billion barrels, but we know that we, the rate of decline is far greater than the rate of demand. Uh, and that's where this particular graph that had showed us at peak at roughly 2012 has now been moved out to roughly about 2015. And peak oil is, is, in very simple terms, is the maximum amount of oil that we can bring into the marketplace on any particular day at an affordable price. Meaning based upon all the oil that we can pull out of the ground worldwide, transport, process, retail, put into, into people's gas tanks. The maximum amount that we can bring out is not necessarily halfway through the oil, but it's what we can afford to bring out. And we just saw where we hit $147 a barrel. Uh, that was the wake-up call. Because uh, if you looked at the world markets, in the world markets there were only a, a few hundred thousand barrels per day buffer in between supply and demand. So we have really backed off of that and, and now we're starting to see gas go back up because the demand is going back up and the dollar, the value of the dollar is going down. And the more that the value of the dollar goes down, the higher the price of oil goes because oil is traded in US dollars. So the less that our dollar is worth, the more that we have to pay for it in order to make up that difference. So it's, it's, it's a double whammy in that regard. So we're now back to, I think today we were roughly 68 dollars a barrel. We had been down around 30, I think 38, 35, 38 is about as low as we got. And this is, uh, I think, pretty much the last slide on this one. This is Matthew Simmons, who's CEO of Simmons & Company, uh, the largest energy investment banker in the world. He was one of the chief advisors to uh, uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney's White House Energy Task Force, and he is now making speeches around the world saying that we need to deal with this uh, and in fact, you can go out to his website and all of his presentations are out there. All of his PowerPoints are out there. You can see what it is that he's saying and he's not pulling any punches about how serious that he believes this to be. On the other hand, there are folks making money at this. The Bakken Oil Reserve in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Northern Oil and Gas, little uh, exploration company, um, doing quite well. Another company who's come out with uh, getting ready to commercialize an industrialized microwave unit that can be lowered down old oil wells in order to basically cook them, uh, in order to drive the really tar-based sort of oil that we couldn't pump out under normal circumstances. Uh, so they stand, if they, if they come true on this, they stand to make a ton of cash in that regard. In terms of food, this is out of the USDA. 
this is where we have been in terms of production of food since 1970. We continue to rise, uh, obviously in a very positive sort of way. At the same time, this is our storage of, of grains and oil seeds. And so if you put those two graphs together, it basically says that we are consuming everything we're producing plus we are consuming our storage. We're now at record lows. Up until this past harvest last year, we were at record lows of roughly 51 days of grain supply left on a worldwide basis. So that's, on the one hand, some people is, you know, find that really scary. On the other hand, imagine a local food system in which all the money that we're currently shipping out of our communities stays in our communities plus having food that can be shipped into those broader markets. It's nothing new, it's just where we used to be that we have outsourced ourselves out of. You combine that with what the implications are for continuing to put large amounts of grain into alcohol and biodiesel, and the food versus fuel sort of an issue becomes uh, a, uh, a, an unsustainable sort of trend like this. This is bringing it into our own backyard. This is the amount of money that we spend in Wisconsin on an annual basis in terms of all energy consumed in the state. So in terms of coal, oil, gas, electricity, uh, as well as across all industrial sectors of transportation, ag, industrial, commercial, and residential, we're spending $21.5 billion. We did in 2007. In 2006, we were about $2 billion less than that. It rose $2 billion in one year. Most of that money is leaving the state. So we have no fossil fuels, we have no uranium, and so we have to ask the question, can we continue to afford to do that, or do we truly go after energy independence to the greatest degree that we can? And there is no doubt that we can do that, it's simply a matter of deciding that that's what we're going to do. And I think there's, the, the federal government clearly understands that, though they're not, I don't think, telling the general public all that is behind those, um, those policies. Water, I'm not going to spend any time on tonight. Uh, clearly we know, uh, I spent four, uh, a few months ago, I spent four or five days in Tempe, Phoenix, Mesa area, ghost towns waiting to happen. Uh, I feel so fortunate, quite honestly, to live where we live. Uh, when I think about the resource base that we have, especially in terms of, of water, we'll, we'll leave it at that. In terms of land use planning, uh, I think we all understand the, some of the hurdles that we have. In terms of, of how we th talk about this in very polarized sorts of ways, and, and I would argue that sustainability is is nothing more than traditional American values of self-determination, self-sufficiency, ingenuity, creativity, responsibility to community. It's, it's, it's traditional American values that's not liberal or conservative, it's not Republican or Democrat. It's basic traditional American values. And it, certainly we can, we can have spirited discussions about how we get at that, uh, but I, I and clearly we have major issues to, to deal with in terms of personal freedom versus public good and personal property rights, planning, zoning, and ordinances and sustainability and unsustainability. Clearly uh, those issues need to be dealt with. But be careful who we ask. Um, because this is where it gets dangerous. This is, okay, what do we do? Okay, here's the definition of sustainability. Here's what we see that's driving it. So the question becomes, what do we do? Whose crystal ball is the best to gaze into in terms of how we go at this? And I, oh, sorry, I left the Rotarians on that. I just, uh, I was the, the morning keynote for the district Rotary. Uh, <laughs> and actually the district president actually looked, he wasn't dressed like this, but it was, <laughs> everybody kind of got the, uh, the connection. Strategy is everything. This is, this is where it gets to the point of saying, uh, one of the old sayings in, in the culture that I come from, I was born and raised in Kentucky, but left there in 1980. If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. I'm sure there are similar sorts of, of wisdom in virtually every part of the country. 
And having had having a youngest son who's now 22 has been infatuated with Homer Simpson for way too long. <laughs> I couldn't help but uh, put him up there against Einstein, who said the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. But basically, certainly there are natural occurrences that throw curveballs. You know, earthquakes, volcanoes, natural weather, cycling, those kinds of things. But invariably, we have clearly altered the playing field. <laughs> and it's not like we don't have solutions. We have all kinds of solutions. It's just a matter of the political will to bring them about. Uh, so relocalization, resiliency, restoration, shared vision, language, sense of urgency, political, personal will to make these kinds of changes. And I can guarantee you that it can only happen with the partnerships that you find within communities. Between government, between education, nonprofits, uh, the, the business community, absolutely critical to have everyone at the table in, in terms of how you go at this. So one of the ways that, is, that this is being done is through the natural step, which is a framework which we'll spend just a few minutes on. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you call it the natural step, and if you don't like the natural step, you can call it the three-toed sloth waltz or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter it's, it's, as long as the process makes sense to you. But it's at the municipal level that it really makes a difference, as we looked at a little bit earlier. And it's exactly what you're now talking about in terms of your comprehensive plan. It says, okay, we have an awareness that sustainability may be a really important thing to integrate into our plan. Okay? If, we, if we take that as a given, it's a matter of saying, where are we now? What are the conditions under which we currently exist, ecologically, socially, and economically? Meaning benchmarking, where are we now? Visioning where it is that we want to be. What's, how far out on the limb do you want to climb in terms of saying, what do you want your community to look like in 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years? What would your kids want it to look like? Their grandkids, what would, what would they want it to look like? What do you think that they would want it to look like? And then based upon where you are and what that vision is, then what are the steps that you take in order to incrementally get there? And, and the speed at which you do that is obviously up to you and, and the investment that you make in that, but it's, it's a matter of going through that, that visioning and backcasting sort of process. The framework is built upon four basic conditions. And Dr. Carl Heinrich Robert, who created this in Sweden and ran it through a exhausting scientific review of the scientists throughout Sweden in order to get 100% consensus around these four conditions that no one could, could uh, take issue with in terms of how they were written and how they were applied. It's basically the idea of in a sustainable society, nature is not subject to systematically increasing. So it's saying Here's what we know that we should not do to our own nest in, if we want to have a high quality of life long term. One is not allow concentrations of substances extracted from the Earth's crust to build up in the biota. So CO2, an obvious one. CO2, I really encourage on, on climate change and CO2, I really encourage you to think about how the media and various people are playing that argument, playing it in a very polarized sort of way. You will find folks who are, who are arguing that CO2 should not be managed by the EPA as a pollutant. And then you will find others who will argue that CO2 is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And you go out to a greenhouse and pump the greenhouse full of CO2 and see what happens. What happens? All the plants die. Go out to the greenhouse and pump all the CO2 out of the greenhouse. What happens? All the plants die. There is a range of tolerance in which the natural world exists in a healthy condition. And if we get outside of that range of tolerance, other things are going to happen. It's like uh, not long ago there was, uh, it's been a year ago, somebody died from drinking too much water. Okay? They drink, I don't know, drink five gallons of water in a single day and see what happens to you. We think that water is innocuous, you know, that it's so. Oh, you can't get enough water. Well, it can kill you. Okay. So it is what is what makes sense in terms of living systems in terms of CO2 or mercury. Go to the boundary waters 
and, and eat as much fish as you can hold for a couple of weeks uh, and, and then go have a body burden test for mercury. And, and if you've ever read Alice in Wonderland and you're familiar with the uh, Mad Hatter, uh, mercury ha does really nasty things. Uh, so if you, if you go fishing and, and we know where the mercury is coming from, it's coming primarily from coal burning power plants. But you get uh, fish consumption warnings. It will say how many fish of what species, of what size you can eat out of what lake, how many times a week or a month, depending on whether you're male or female, pregnant or nursing, plan to be pregnant or nursing. Because we know that mercury does really nasty things to fetuses and to children, as well as to the women who are bearing those children. So it just makes sense that we know where that mercury is coming from. We have the technology to remove the vast majority of it. We simply haven't had the political will to stop doing it because we have to pay for it. The second one is don't allow concentrations of, of substances produced by society. So whether that is phthalates, uh, plasticizers in plastic, which I can show you studies of male carp and male walleye be below this pig's eye sewage treatment plant in St. Paul, Minnesota, the male fish that are turning female. They're producing vitalogenin, which is an egg yolk protein, that only female fish would produce when they're laying eggs because of the amount of endocrine disruptors that are coming out of a water treatment plant that's not designed to remove them. Okay. And we know where those are coming from. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The same thing in terms of degradation of, of ecological systems. So whether it's massive clear cuts, my youngest son is a professional forester. He's a professional logger. So we have some really interesting conversations about this. Uh, we need wood products. Clear cutting makes total sense in some circumstances, but it doesn't make sense on mountainsides that are like this, where you have salmon spawning streams at the bottom. Basic physics. Stuff rolls downhill. Uh, the last one is, these three are easy. It's the last one that's the most difficult. It's the one that's about the social justice equity side. And you think about the discussion that we're now having in this country about socialism. I mean, the socialism card has been played in terms of who's a socialist and who's not a socialist. Well, I mean, I, oh, I'm always scared when I get to this part of the conversation. <laughs> Social Security. Huh? Yeah, I've been thinking about getting a permit myself. Yeah, well, you can't find ammunition now. Um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm price support system. Student loans, student grants. Uh, think about all of the public benefit programs that we have, especially Social Security, which is as socialistic as it gets. This is not about turning into the Soviet Union. Nobody in their right mind wants to become the big S Soviet Socialist Union. But if we have gotten to the point that we can't even have a conversation about social responsibility, because somebody's afraid of being called a socialist, then we're in much deeper doo-doo than we ever imagined. Because that is, that's the underpinning of what community is all about. I mean, I've been in conversations where people will say, uh, well, community, you know, it's as overused a term as sustainability is. If community has outlived its value as a word that describes whether or not and how we live peacefully with each other and the planet we live on, then again, we are in very deep duty. And I hope that doesn't come across as preachy, but it's just kind of like I think it needs to be said. So natural step study circle process, and I can give you all kinds of framework that makes that a very easy process to go through. It's just a matter of using the Natural Step for Communities book. Uh, that is a really good way to have these conversations. If you're really interested in sustainability and not only sustainability but the natural step, the best website that I found in the world right now is TNS Canada. So if you just go out to Google, punch in TNS Canada, they have a really good background on sustainability on, and on the natural step and, and applying it. We're into the solution phase. When you think about sustainability applied to a comprehensive plan, Think about it in a holistic context, meaning a sustainable community is literally dependent upon this entire uh, uh, set of entry points in terms of how we think about how we live in community 
in a very integrated, synergistic sort of way. If they are treated as individual silos, I can guarantee you, and that's part of what's gotten us into the problems that we have, is the right and left hand have not been talking to each other. Um, it is, is very critical to think of it in that very holistic sort of way. But at a fundamental level, this is it. But at, at the most fundamental level, the thing that keeps society going as we currently know it is cheap energy, cheap fossil fuels. And cheap fossil fuels is a thing of the past. It is going to continue to go up by almost all measures and predictions. So the sooner that we move to self-sustaining energy systems uh, within, within healthy uh, ecology, the better off we're going to be and we can have a long conversation about that. One of the really good resources that's out there, and Dave and you and Mark, uh, who was it, Brian? Uh, who, your other planner. Uh, you probably are familiar with one of the really good resources that's out there. It's one thing to talk about your plan, but sooner or later you take that plan and you really start to talk about ordinate policies and ordinances. And, and I just know from my own experience of having been on a lot of land use planning boards and having taught uh, land use planning for a long time that finding model ordinances is really critical. So Minnesota planning has a set of model ordinances for sustainable development that's put out in 2000. It's now being updated. And so you're now finding uh, a lot of uh, uh, very specific uh, upgrades in much of the language that, that they suggest. And you simply take their language and say, okay, does this language fit our community or not? And then you adjust that language, but it, it really gives you a place to start. Uh, one of the ones I just went in and, and pulled out, this is a one for, for solar. We have far more solar potential than we have ever been led to believe in this country. And, and in the state. Uh, Germany, who has virtually no better solar potential than we have, is literally betting its future on photovoltaics. Uh, and photovoltaics is becoming, especially in this state, where we have some really good incentives, uh, which I'll talk about in, in just a little bit. It's, it's uh, coming down in price very quickly. And so these are some land use planning uh, suggested ordinances that literally talk about the orientation of new developments. So if a developer wants to come into the community, he say, oh, we'd love for you to come into the community, but here's also how the standards by which we would like for you to design that housing development. We would like for every one of the houses to be set on an east-west axis so that it maximizes the southern exposure of that house because you will find so many developments who have now been put in where the ability to retrofit any type of solar hot water, solar hot air, photovoltaics is extremely expensive because they have thrown the house in such an odd angle to the maximum southern exposure. Uh, and how close houses uh, should be or without shadowing each other. Uh, and I can tell you that it works. Um, my wife and I have 2.7 kilowatts of photovoltaics at our house. It covers uh, half of our electricity during the summer. It's covering about three-fourths of our electricity. And um, it's, it's, uh, it takes care of itself to a very large degree. So these last few, there's I think about a half a dozen slides left. And these are examples of projects that I'm currently involved in that I think will give you a sense of where how other folks are approaching this. This is the city of River Falls where we have the Powerful Choices Group where we're moving toward 100% energy self-sufficiency and carbon neutrality. Uh, we've already done a community energy audit, so again, we're benchmarking how much energy, energy does the community need. We've already done a wind mapping study and we just finished a 200-foot uh, wind uh, anemometer test over the last year. And so we now know that we have low to moderate commercial wind on the ridge tops around the community. So we're now looking at how do we finance five to six commercial turbines of about 1.5 megawatts, which are about $3 million a piece. So most people say $3 million, I mean, it occur, especially in the current financial situation we have now. But when you look at the cost, es the, the cost escalation rates that are estimated in terms of electricity and the carbon market that's coming in, 
uh, there is far more money to be made there than the average person uh, will uh, ever recognize, or at least currently recognizes, because we're not used to this sort of, of analysis. Renewable energy finance project. We're getting ready to actually advertise for a position of someone to run this program. And it was taken from an idea in Berkeley, California, where they were applying it only to foldable tax. But it is, in very simple terms, it is a process where the city or the county or a township, whoever wants to do it, bonds for whatever set of amount of money we're going to bond for either one or two million dollars. That money will be made available to all residential owners to be able to put in insulation, solar hot water, solar hot air, photovoltaics, wind, geothermal, any technology that moves us toward energy independence and carbon neutrality. They apply it against their property tax for 20 years at a low rate of interest. And so it's amortized over that period and the cost escalation rates and the savings and the incentives that the municipal utilities has given pays it off much more quickly than the end of the final end of that loan. Our, our uh, municipal utilities has now gotten permission from the Public Service Commission to buy back photovoltaic electricity at 30 cents per kilowatt hour. We're currently paying about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So imagine a system where in Focus on Energy, which is the state program, 25% rebate. Federal tax incentives are currently 30% tax credit with no upper limit, plus a buyback at 30 cents per kilowatt hour. I've already seen uh, formal bids for a number of people in the community. Their systems will be paid off in at maximum five years. And we're talking forty dollars to $50,000 investments. So it is totally voluntary. It's flow through money, doesn't affect anybody's tax rate. Uh, it's, it's, it's not pushing anybody into anything, but it's creating as large of a carrot as we can possibly create and still make sure that we are financially in better shape than we would have been otherwise. Are those businesses that you sell the proposals or these that are applications for? So far, uh, those are businesses who actually, uh, the ones that I've seen have been for a set of apartment houses and for individual residences. We haven't done this, we're not doing businesses yet because there's a number of programs out for businesses and we're still kind of debating whether or not we're gonna go there. And then we built a brand new city hall and it looks like it's gonna be a gold lead, uh, but we had all kinds of arguments about whether or not it ought to produce as much energy as it consumes. Another project that, that I'm involved in, in fact, I was in long meetings in Madison about uh, this afternoon. I'm working with the village and school district of Osceola, Wisconsin, which is about an hour north of the Twin Cities on the, on the Wisconsin side of the St. Croix River. Very cute little community, about 2,730 some odd people, about 9,000 people in the school district. And the community has adopted a 100 by 25. That is, they intend to be 100% energy and food self-sufficient by 2025. It's what oftentimes people call is the big, hairy, audacious goal, the BHAG. It is bold, it is audacious, but the, the, I've been in too many of these to know that when folks set a very low goal, they will achieve even less. You shoot for the highest goal that you are willing to go after and then you do your best to get there, recognizing that to get to 100% is, yeah, it would be a phenomenal feat. But it is what we need in order to drive us as close to that as we can get there because it's the economic future of that community. Great, great question. Osceola, I've worked in so many communities where there's a really strong citizens advocacy, but there's nobody at the top who has the same vision. And I've been in communities where they have the vision at the top, and there's nobody in the community who's willing to stand up in public meetings and be in support of it. In Osceola, they have now, they're now on their seventh natural step study circle group, so there's a really strong uh, citizens advocacy group that has all shares the same language and I mean they know how to talk to each other in terms of everybody knows what the terms mean and what their goals are. And the village administrator 
the school superintendent, the president of the school board, who's now in his 26th year as president of the school board. It's got to be a state record. <laughs> uh, uh, have all been part of those study circles. We have had the, the plant manager of Polaris, who's the largest employer uh, in the community, the CEO of Northwire, uh, the director of the library, uh, the CEO of the hospital, and the CEO and president of the bank who are all at the table. And so it's one of those communities where you literally have a very strong citizens advocacy and you have the same, and you have people at the top who share the same vision. And that's where you really make a lot of progress very quickly. So, you know, it's, it's how, does, how does a community uh, get both ends of the spectrum onto that same page. And the natural step is just one framework by which you can get there. And all of your eggs would be in the basket if you had a school you mentioned would get the patient. And that's a, a resource that every small community has in abundance. Uh, yep. Why don't you consider it? Uh, in fact, that has been talked about uh, very dramatically. And um, the one thing that we're trying, and we just, part of it's just having the space to do it. Because uh, when we're talking about energy, and, and uh, I haven't missed uh, gas, uh, gasification, but we're also talking about woody uh, biomass pellets, grassy biomass pellets, gasification, uh, uh, alcohol fuels, anaerobic digestion. And so what we're trying to do is <coughs> we're now at that stage of bringing the rest of the community into that conversation and making sure that we don't set a necessary, we don't make uh, biased uh, decisions about what mix of energy technologies that we assume are automatically going to be a part of that mix. Uh, even though I, I totally agree with you, gasification is a great way to go. Uh, and we are having those conversations. Others? So we have put in for a major stimulus proposal at the federal level. Um, uh, actually, this is $43.5 million that we put through our River Country RCND, and I don't know what the name of your RCND uh, here in this particular region, but we went through our RCND, and we know that our proposals are on the national desk at NRCS, and they've already been back for information twice, uh, and we know that they've got momentum. Whether or not we're going to see it is a whole different deal. We're looking at literally a vertically integrated food system in terms of a regionally adapted seed bank, and all of this being municipally owned, eco-industrial enterprise uh, zones, so starting up small businesses, uh, regional seed bank, training, small business incubation, small farm business incubation, food aggregation and distribution, the idea that uh, Cisco is not likely to be a part of this model. <laughs> uh, and it's nothing against Cisco, but they represent one of the largest leakages of money out of our food system unless they're willing to come in and put a warehouse in the community and, and collect locally and distribute locally, it's money that's leaving the community. Fruit, vegetable, and grain uh, processing, meat processing, commercial kitchen, food education, and a nutrient composting, digestion, recycling incubator that could be everything from anaerobic digestion, gasification, alcohol fuels, to vermiculture and selling <coughs> of uh, commercial worm pellets uh, from, from digestion of of waste organic matter. This is just a model of looking at all the different places that somebody can plug into just the, the food system alone in terms of everything from, from the seed bank to production, both plants, animals, fruits, vegetables, to marketing, distribution, processing, to, uh, to marketing and, and institutional demand in the community, to nutrient recycling, energy recovery, and I did get gas. The last one uh, is an eco-village. I'm on the Habitat for Humanity board in Pearson St. Croix County, and we're going after a eco-village uh, that literally trying, we think that we've got the model worked out. We're in the final design uh, stages for construction level design of literally building homes that will produce, if not as much, if not more energy than they consume. And so we literally bring, are able to sell houses at affordable prices uh, to people who will see their energy bills basically disappear, as well as having local uh, agricultural production, 
uh, stormwater uh, management, uh, local cottage industry enterprises, that sort of thing. So the very last slide, or next to the last, uh, I really encourage you to um, go as far out on the limb as you're willing to go. Uh, because that's, that's what will really drive you to some place different than we might otherwise imagine. Questions, comments, reactions? Please. Yeah, um, I've been convinced for all year about it needing to be more sustainable, but um, I like the help of schools, or help me at least, with how we write into our comprehensive plan uh, what kind of what kind of positioning we put in our comprehensive plan that leads to or enables sustainability, and not only writing ordinances, I'm on planning and zoning committee, writing ordinances and enforcing ordinances that enable people to be more sustainable, enable communities to be more sustainable. Yep, yep. Um, two different questions. One is how do you integrate it into the plan? And second, how do you then get teeth behind yeah. it, yeah. basically? Um, having been involved in a number of these, and, and a number of them in process at the moment, there are ones that I can that I won't name that I can name that are taking sustainability and energy, and they're sticking it out here as another satellite topic to cover. And as I, if I heard correctly before this meeting occurred, is that you folks are thinking about putting it in as an integrated systemic part of the plan. That in my mind, that's exactly where you have to go because otherwise, sustainability will be treated as a token sort of element. In the smart growth legislation, there are nine elements that the plan has to address. If you look at those nine elements, energy is nowhere to be found. It's implied. It's implied in a couple of them, especially in terms of transportation, that sort of thing. But it does not specifically address energy as a critical issue of comprehensive planning. So you're now seeing a number of, I mean, you're seeing around the state of local units of government that are going back and rewriting their plans or trying to integrate sustainability in. And unless you're, unless you're thinking about how do you write sustainability-based planning in terms of all of those elements, you will, my experience is that you will find a lot of conflict at the end uh, for having done that. You will, you will find where you're thinking about sustainability in one place, not thinking about it in another, and those two will find themselves at odds on a very regular basis. So I, my recommendation is I strongly encourage you down the road that you're already going, is that the language and the spirit of intent is strong in the vision and that it is, it is discussed in the context of the entire plan. And then as you go through those nine elements, there's nothing in the law that says that you can't add element number 10, which is energy. And, and then it's a matter of going to like those, um, uh, if you're in need of more language, go to those Minnesota planning uh, model for, for model ordinances. Uh, that will give you a lot of the language that you're looking for in terms of how that actually gets uh, uh, enforced. And then it's a matter of having somebody on staff that, that everyone in the community knows that this is what we've done and this is what we're going to enforce. And if you go through the community sorts of discussions that are necessary to get to consensus, everybody knows what's coming. But the, the thing that also is very important about sustainability is that I would really encourage you toward, and that I think that you'll see in those ordinances, is that they are very performance standard based. They don't prescribe exactly what a landowner has to do. I mean, that's, that's, that's government control that none of us like, that we know that we rail against every chance we get, especially when it applies to us. So how do you set performance standards and then allow business and developers and whoever else is coming into your community to be creative in how they give you what they want? And that's, it's, that's what corporations rail against all the time, is government historically telling them, you will use this particular type of technology at the end of your waste pipe, and it will cost you this amount of money, rather than government saying, here's, here's the maximum amount of pollutants that we think is healthy for our community to come out of your waste pipe. 
You tell us how you think you can best meet that standard. That's the way that you get to a really uh, much better consensus uh, in, in a community. Because I know I work with, with developers that uh, would do a phenomenal job if they didn't have to deal with a lot of the ordinances that tie their hands in terms of what they can do and what they can't do. It's a matter of, for instance, in Osceola, we're brainstorming around uh, energy independence in the community, and we're literally having discussions about uh, an ordinance that says any new development that comes into the community has to be a carbon neutral development. We don't care how you get there, but it has to be a carbon neutral development. So if they're coming in and building 50 houses and creating an entire new subdivision, great. But tell us and demonstrate to us how those 50 houses are going to be carbon neutral. And we will welcome you with open arms. That sort of thing. And it, again, it is, it is it's a very, very tough discussion. And these are, these are just the discussions we're having. We haven't gone to the point of even floating that uh, in a legal way to see whether or not the community is willing to buy it. That's where the conversations are being had at the moment. federal regulations like on food processing, food production, and so forth. You can do it to your way at locally, but what if that's at odds with federal regulations? How is that factor mitigated? Yeah, there's a lot of, in fact, we had a little bit of that discussion this afternoon when I was uh, at DACAP for a couple of hours, is, uh, you know, if you're a local producer and you're selling at the farmer's market, you have virtually very few restrictions about food safety related sorts of things. As soon as you start selling into an institutional market, uh, that becomes, so there are all kinds of discussions that at the highest levels that recognize that we need to totally revamp uh, our food safety regulations in order to encourage local development rather than to discourage it. Because if you look at the data in terms of what most commonly makes people sick, it's primarily coming from industrialized agricultural production. And I don't mean that as a slam because, I mean, we all eat. I, you know, I love to eat. But, well, my wife and I grow most of our own food, so we don't buy a whole lot of, of processed food. But uh, you find that uh, the, the risk of getting sick from locally produced food is far less <coughs> than, than our industrial-based systems for a variety of different reasons. So, yeah, those discussions are being had. But in order to get that through the legislature, the political, until people are willing to stand up on both sides of the aisle and say, we're cutting our own throats here by continuing to force these kinds of behaviors that are economically not in our own best interest. Uh, you talked a little bit about like, removing barriers and also like, implementing regulations for fun. How do you see uh, changing behavior as part of it? I mean, it seems like a lot of part of the problem is just folks that maybe don't have the opportunity to live in maybe a little more sustainable way yeah. because of the way our city and communities are planned, of course, to drive or what have you. So I um, was wondering if you talk a little bit about planning, particularly comprehensive planning, and how it might help change your behavior. We'll look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> the hardest it's part. like removing barriers. No. Part of that because there's a lot of discussion yep. in cities now where they're actually uh, writing new zoning codes that allow like urban agriculture, for example. Yep. Uh, whereas that wasn't you know allowed in a lot of areas like Madison. Yeah, yeah, the change of chicken the chickens in the backyard or <laughs> yep. you know, ways. That no roosters, but chickens. <laughs> you know, and certainly like to provide people with density and then maybe it facilitates walking and things like that. But in yep. maybe a more rural area. It, it literally means having a community education program that is that has as much time and energy put into it as you put into actually writing the plan and carrying it out. So for example, in Osceola, uh, one of the most important partners that we have in this, and, and another one that I'll talk a little bit more about, is the school district. The school district is fully on board in this plan and process. So we are, We've got a number. We've got a couple of grants out, um, but whether we get the grants or not, putting it into the K-12 curriculum, 
and having the students be involved in literally uh, uh, real time uh, developing the websites uh, for both the school as well as the community education, taking that home to their parents in terms of what it is the community is doing, having websites that literally have real time readout on the renewable energy systems that we have at the school. So for instance, they put in a solar hot water system last July to heat the entire pool, they have a major pool complex uh, with hot tub and warming up pool and the whole nine yards. And through this entire last winter, they had two hours, literally two hours, that the natural gas boiler kicked in in order to keep the water at 80 degrees. Otherwise, it was totally heated by the solar hot water system on the roof. You, you take that over time in terms of, and measure that against the gas uh, and the cost to the school district that would have been spent in that regard. They just now spent, they just allocated $57,000 to put a floating blanket on top of the swimming pool. There were a number of people who were, you know, communities that are struggling as much as every other community financially. What do you mean you're spending $57,000 to put a floating blanket on the swimming pool? Well, we've already, <laughs> it's paid for in two and a half years. Just literally, and, and it was costing, uh, was it 23, they're, they're, they know that they're saving $23,000 per year as a result of putting that floating blanket on the swimming pool. So it is, it's that how do you, people respond not to, well, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. People go like, Pfft. But if you show them the numbers, you show them the numbers of what the long-term payoff is of making those kinds of investments in some other comparison than in present day value, because we know present day value is going to change very, very rapidly, especially in terms of energy. Uh, the payoff is, is phenomenal. And that's, that's where, whether it's in energy, whether it's in food, whether transportation, uh, they're literally looking at, we have a couple hundred acres out around the airport, and there's one discussion that says we'll grow uh, canola uh, seeds, get our own oil press, produce our own biodiesel, all of our school buses uh, are going to get converted to either biodiesel and or uh, whatever other alcohol fuel that we can produce or natural gas uh, that we can produce off of gasification. Uh, there are variations of such. This particular one is not out there. I'm more than happy to put it in a PDF and I can ship it to Dave and, and you guys can put it on there. We just quick comment that, that this, actually we're taping this tonight and it will be put on the YouTube, our, um, our YouTube website and you can find a link on the Clark County website. And also as mentioned the Richard Longworth presentation, that one's already on YouTube and available on the county planning website. So it'll be there. And there's a group in Green Bay that I'm I've heard of them, but I don't know them. They do a lot of work on this concept of the internal velocity of money keeping in the local energy. Mm -hmm. That they would be very useful to you. Yep. And I have a strong criticism of something you said, sure. which is describing Social Security as a socialist program. Mm -hmm. And if you say that, you're allowing your opponents to define the playing field, the rules of the game, mm -hmm. and become the umpires. That statement is false. And the reason it's false, mm -hmm. I've done the numbers. If you take your Social Security payments and treat it like a purchase of Treasury bills okay. at the current rates of the year in which you made the payment and accumulate that money, your Social Security payment would be about twice what it is. What hmm. happens is that the federal government has a quote borrowed, the interpret that as stolen, mm -hmm. the Social Security. had a long conversation about that. Uh, conceptually, in terms of where, and, and I don't disagree with you, except conceptually. 
in, in terms of where that how that conversation is typically held in most communities. And when we think about any program, quote unquote, entitlement program, that attempts to level the playing field and attempts to show a sense of responsibility by the broader community to its individual members in, in a way that, uh, that uh, to some people rewards people who haven't pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps and created their own security for retirement. Uh, there's a whole very complex discussion that goes with that philosophically and conceptually. So I don't disagree with you at all, and I, and I, I, I appreciate the lesson in the Treasury bill reinvestment. The vast majority of people don't think about their Social Security being rollover reinvestment in Treasury bills in order to reap three or four times uh, its value. Which I, current well, Treasury bills, well, you know, except for those Treasury bills that were that were serving up zero percent interest a few months ago. Well, yeah. Again, that's that's the reason we get into a very. But I point well made. Others. Ecotourism is is the fastest growing element of tourism. And it's oftentimes difficult to tell where those boundaries are between standard industrial tourism, ecotourism, nature tourism, and, and um, actually and, I spent. And how to influence those um, hoteliers, the, the innkeepers, the folks who run the water park, yeah. how to help them think more global, more regionally about how their activities are affecting. And where I've seen that be really successful is in communities that share a common vision about, and that is a strong sense of place and, I, and a cultural identity that they want to identify, celebrate, and preserve that, that the ecotourism community also recognizes becomes a marketing leverage point for them that other ecotourism settings won't have. So it's, 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 it's so, and I think we're all used to it. I mean, you go into so many communities and it's like anywhere USA. I mean, you drive down any strip development or commercial development and it's like, you could be in any number of 10,000 communities in, in this country. But it's the communities who have literally told commercial entities like, and again, this is not a slam against McDonald's or Walmart or whoever else, but if you don't demand from them what it is that reinforces the identity that you have chosen, whether it's for tourism or for all other marketing, that, whether it's for value-added products that are coming out of your community or whatever it happens to be, they will give you what is the most cost-efficient to them, which is a cookie-cutter design that comes out of the corporate office that says, we know how to do this, and we can do it a thousand times repeatedly, and we know how much money we can make out of each one. But it's communities who literally write their, their plan and their ordinances in such a way that this is the community identity that we have. Any commercial business coming in, must, the architecture must reflect uh, this identity. And I, I can show, I don't, have them, I don't have them here, but I can go out and show you any number of a dozen uh, examples around the country where McDonald's doesn't look anything like the McDonald's that we are all used to seeing. You'll see them in colonial houses, you will see them in uh, Vermont sorts of chalets, you will see them in, I used to live just outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, you will, you will see Walmarts and Kmarts that have an entire western facade across the front of them. Because the community said, 
you want to come into this community, this is what you got to look like. Because we're not going to have you come in and change the cultural identity of our community. It would also be a wonderful opportunity to, some, I'm not sure how to do it, but all those people that are coming to that area, it's an opportunity for education, and it's also an opportunity to start thinking with those, with those in, uh, businesses about how they are going to get their customers there when peak oil and that's that's where that's this is and it comes back to Kevin's uh, Kevin's gone now it comes back to Kevin's question about uh, the, the educational change that has to occur people have to believe the data I mean if if, if I mean, you think about where we get our sense of truth as adults in, in broad sorts of ways we get it from religious values we get it from political values and we get it from science. As children, it's, it's, it's family, it's peers, it's church, it's education. Uh, but once we reach adult stage, peers still have a strong influence and families can have a strong influence, but it tends to be very strongly couched in politics, religion, and science. And, and we have pretty much dismissed, we've become a culture that has begun to really dismiss any science that we don't like the conclusions of. If it's science that says, oh, here's, here's what you can do to change the, 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 uh, the feed uh, regimen on your dairy herd in order to get another 100 pounds of production a month, we'll take that science and run with it in two seconds. If it's science that says, ooh, climate change is looking like a reality and maybe we better stop driving so much, and it's kind of like, I don't believe that science. The science can never prove anything 100%. But, but we are now at a point where we either believe the data or we don't. And as I tell even my own institution, if we don't believe our own data and we're not going to even run our own university based upon that data, we might as well close our doors. Because we, we will literally become irrelevant as a publicly funded institution. If we can't walk the talk and show leadership about how this can be done as a stable <coughs> campus community, we're irrelevant. Um, and, and so it's, it's, I mean, I don't mean for it to be, to be harsh, but it's, it's a matter of either, either we believe science or we, and it's not like you, I'm not saying you substitute science for religion and politics. They need to inform each other. Uh, um, but to leave, to leave the science out just because we don't like what the results are saying is a very dangerous thing. I'm curious of how many people there are community elected officials like our mayors. Are there any mayors here? I think that's a big part of our problem. Right. But well, we do have some elected officials here. Hi, guys. I see you. <laughs> there we go. I, I. Where's our mayor? Where's the mayor of Bear Blue? The mayor of South City? That's, they are here. I, I genuinely applaud the elected officials here. I mean, I honestly, I remember sitting through town board meetings that would start at, and if I was on the planning commission, it started at seven, and I wouldn't get home until one o'clock in the morning, and people screaming and pounding their fist, and when my wife started getting harassed in the grocery store, that's when I said, okay, I don't know. Because I'd come home and I'd get it from her, like, you know what they said to me in the, in the dairy aisle today? Uh, one question I had, you talked about the uh, poor system conditions that the natural step uses basically to evaluate, you know, how strategies that have been adopted or, or policies will, will help them achieve a, a future vision. Are there other measures of sustainability that could be uh, incorporated into a into a implementation process for of course, system conditions, the natural step, I think, really cover a lot of territory, but yeah. are there other ones that might be useful? There, it's, the natural step is clearly the one that is being used the most to my, uh, to my knowledge. Otherwise, it is using the same model. Most communities are using the same model of, well, this is the way we've always done it, and we'll make a few changes here and there. Uh, but the natural step is something that really forces that. 
other ones like is in the natural step is used by is used by uh, Nike, IKEA, a number of major uh, multinationals. So it's, it works for both businesses as well as communities as well as personal life. Others are like ISO fourteen thousand, which is primarily used in, in business related sorts of models, uh, and it gets at environmental management systems. So for communities who only want to think about sustainability from an ecologic or environmental perspective. ISO 14000 can be adapted to a community use. It's typically used for businesses. Um, there's a brand new set of standards coming out of ISO on social uh, responsibility. Uh, was it ISO 20, 23 or 26000, I think. It's still in, in uh, public comment period. Um, and then there's the, the series uh, principles. Um, Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economies. You'll see a lot of businesses. You see, only, I've only seen a few communities who have referenced it as there's 10 principles and, and a reporting scheme that goes with um, being a responsible entity. Uh, it's an international nonprofit that, that has, uh, if you just go out on Google and punch in CERES series, known as a series principles. Uh, it's, it, and act as another framework. Please, Jimmy. Um, sometimes you talk about sustainability, and folks will say, well, does that mean you can never fill in a wetland? Does that mean I can never fly to Mexico on vacation? Um, what is your response to that? <laughs> um, sustainability only goes as far as the community allows it to go. I mean, if, if there's not community consensus, around what it means and, and how it's going to be applied, then it's going to fail. I can't imagine a community, someone who uses that sort of leverage point that says, oh, we're going back to horse and buggy, and I, you know, it's, it, horse and buggy is kind of romantic, but I don't see us going back to horse and buggy if we use our heads uh, about what's going on here. Um, uh, and there's already solar-based airplanes and electric airplanes that are being tested, whether or not we're going to get uh, and, and, and solar and wind-assisted major cargo ships that are already in use. I mean, the technology is there to change and to solve most of the issues that we have, but the window of, of opportunity is closing in terms of how fast we can bring those technologies into the marketplace at a scale that can make a difference in substituting for the systems we currently have that are coal, oil, natural gas is not nearly as bad, but especially coal and oil based. Nuclear is an entirely different uh, discussion. Um, so typically I find that discussion occurs when somebody simply just doesn't even want to have the conversation. They, they will go to that bottom line of, well, this is you know, going to affect me in a negative way, and so I think this is total BS. You know, and so that is someone who just doesn't want to have the conversation to even figure out where the shades of gray are. So I don't, I don't see that occurring, quite frankly. There's one more question. The, um, we've asked the question twice, how far should we go out on women? And uh, I'll probably get the answer to that. Uh, it just passed where the earth can reach. <laughs> We are, they're actually using the tech, the, the institute is, is, everything that I'm framing now is cash positive, carbon negative, because we need to be, car carbon neutral is a waste. Okay. The community has to decide where they're going to go. If they're going to say a community, that a new development has to be carbon negative, they understand that that puts limitations uh, and additional investment on developers that is even far greater than what carbon neutral would be, depending on what level of carbon negativity that you, you, you aspire to. 
but uh, my, my own sense of overall, carbon neutrality is a waste of time. We already know that we're at 390 parts per million. We know that there is virtually no way that we can stop short of 450 and probably 550 parts per million. Uh, because of, of not only the life of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that we know that even we've cut off all carbon emissions today around the world, uh, heating would continue to occur because uh, carbon, about a third of the carbon has a life of 100 years in the atmosphere. So we know that the heating is going to continue even if we cut off now. So we need, carbon neutrality means status quo. That's running in place. That says where we are is as far as we need to go. Carbon negative is, is the idea that we have to reverse. And, not, and that sounds more challenging on the one hand, but that's where the money is. Because we are, it is almost inevitable that we're going to have an, an international carbon market. And we can argue all day long about the intricacy and the complexity and, and the room for abuse and those kinds of things. But the consensus worldwide is, and China's going to be at the table with us, that we know that we have got to deal with this. Carbon negative means that you have surplus carbon offsets to use in the marketplace that are going to be worth even more money than carbon neutrality will be. And so when you're designing energy systems and food systems, I have a graduate student who's working on his master's thesis, is the combination between native uh, prairie for biomass energy generation, regardless of whether you dry burn it or gasify it or, or liquid uh, fuel, He's combining that with the studies that have been done already on carbon sequestration and on uh, endangered species habitat. And the data is already all out there. We've studied those things to death individually, but nobody's ever come and put them together. And the research at, by David Tillman at the University of Minnesota on native uh, prairie versus, for instance, like switchgrass, native prairie makes switchgrass look like a total waste of time in terms of the amount of biomass energy yield, plus the amount of carbon sequestration, because if you, if you know about prairie plants, the amount of biomass and carbon that gets put into the root system mm -hmm. far exceeds what you see on the surface. Mm -hmm. That's carbon that's being put away, rather, and, and you already have the legumes as part of the mix, so you don't have nearly the long-term uh, maintenance of that crop. I mean, prairies have been around for millions of years because of a self-feeding uh, uh, native ecosystem that, that is self-sustaining, where switchgrass is, um, yeah, it's one way to go at it, but it's, it's an intensive agricultural monoculture that doesn't have nearly the benefit. Maybe that wasn't the point here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the point was that uh, you know, I, I thought you said that if this was a filter, you didn't really have to have anything else went. But that should be, that should get them to the table. That should get the developers to the table. Yep. But after that, uh, you know, I developed, I developed plants. Yep. Uh, probably a thousand acres of, of subdivision so far. Yep. And, and there are, let me suggest that there are many, many more things that go to enhance a sense of community besides just being carbon negative. And, and that's just one, that's just literally just one element. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, density and street widths and stormwater runoff. I mean, there are, you know, it's it's like saying, okay, we want we want zero or five percent or whatever the community decides of percentage of stormwater runoff in pre versus post development, and we don't tell you that it has to be in a storm sewer, or we don't tell you how to do it. It's how how can the developer be left to the creativity uh, and their and their own ability to get to that five percent and the solar orientation and the, the uh, very walkable yet uh, coffee, uh, traffic calming streets uh, and still a sense of community and connection and opportunity. Don't tell the developers how to do it. Here's what we want to be the outcomes. Be creative and we'll support you in every way we can. That's something we're talking about the full range. The carbon neutrality was just one element. We're gonna have to wrap it up here. Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> I can. 
um, don't, it, it, it just depends on the timing, how fast I can get back to you. Um, through the website? Yeah, well, through, my, through the website, it'll go to my program assistant. So if you look at, oh, it's already gone off. Uh, I can leave a, here, I can leave a card with you, and you can put it up on the. Okay. Um, so we'll post something on our website. Yeah, because I, I travel a fair amount, and, and so I'll get, I answer every email that comes through eventually. 